your amazing wedding planning questions answered. That's coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey friends, it's Cara, and I believe that every engaged couple should enjoy the expertise of a down-to-earth, honest, and professional wedding planner. Join me each week for straightforward wedding planning advice designed to streamline and simplify your wedding plans. To learn more about how I can help take the expense and overwhelm out of your wedding planning, visit weddingplanningpodcast.co slash vault. Enjoy the show. Hi there, friend, and thank you so much as always for being here with me today. I design each and every episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast to be as helpful as possible for you. So I absolutely love it when you reach out directly to me with your specific wedding questions, with your ideas for future shows. It really helps me know and trust that I'm providing you with the exact information that you are looking for. Remember, I already planned my wedding. (laughs) It was nine years ago. So this information is not for me, it's for you. And I want it to be as helpful as possible. So a lightning quick public service announcement before we dive in to get in on future Q&A episodes or submit your ideas for future shows. You can send me a DM on Instagram. You'll find me at wedding planning podcast, all one word, super easy. You can also be in touch via the website, which is weddingplanningpodcast.co and visit the contact button. And with that, it's party time. I have six or seven of your wonderful wedding questions to run through today. And to kick things off, a perfect one if you are just recently engaged and jumping into the wedding plans, you're at the beginning. I have a question, what is a good starting point for my wedding planning? Do you have any tips on timelines? This is probably the number one most asked question that I receive when you first get engaged. It's very overwhelming. It's very hard to know where to even begin. So great news. I created a totally free bonus series of the Wedding Planning Podcast, and that's available to you via email when you sign up at weddingplanningpodcast.co slash learn more. I've prepared three bonus episodes just for you if you're feeling overwhelmed at the beginning of your engagement. And in those three episodes, we walk through exactly what steps you should check off your checklist very first thing before you dive into deeper down the road stuff like hiring vendors and thinking about decorations and what people are going to wear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for a complete roadmap that walks you through the very exact things to do first after your engagement, visit weddingplanningpodcast.co slash learn more, all one word, sign up there. It's totally free. And I can't wait to chat with you more in those three bonus episodes. Next question for today is how do I determine what dress code would be best for my wedding guests? Another good question. The dress code is going to depend on a handful of things. First of all, consider the time of year and the location. So of course, if we're celebrating in an area that's freezing cold and your wedding is in February, then you're not going to want to have a luau theme. Okay, (laughs) that's pretty obvious. But do consider the time of year. A summertime wedding is really lends itself to a more casual dress code, in my opinion. It keeps people more comfortable. Um, A black tie formal event is going to be a little bit hard if it's 100 degrees outside and your wedding is on a rooftop in the middle of Arizona in July. So keep things like that in mind. Another key thing that you can consider when thinking about what type of dress code you would like to provide to your guests would be just the overall vibe of your wedding. So if you're going for a very formal, very buttoned up event, then it might be appropriate to ask your guests to come in black tie formal attire. 
On the flip side, if your venue is a really casual beach house and you're going to be spending a lot of time in and out on the sand doing evening bonfire type festivities, then of course a more casual dress code would be more appropriate. I would encourage you to keep top of mind the comfort of your guests. So it's not necessarily so much what you have maybe always dreamed or hoped the wedding guests would be wearing, but more so you're going to need to determine based on your venue, based on the time of year, what's going to be most practical and keep people the most comfortable. I personally have worn Birkenstocks with a long sundress to a wedding before, which in that situation was dressy casual. I would never dream of wearing Birkenstocks to a lot of the other weddings I've been to. So case in point, the vibe of your event is going to determine a lot. And then last thing to consider here, of course, your personal taste, your preference, your opinions matter because hello, it's your wedding. So use those three things as a guideline when you're deciding what to have your guests wear. And then I'm going to take this question a step further on how to communicate that to your guests. We touched on this very briefly in a former Q&A that aired a few weeks back, but a little note at the bottom of your invitation is appropriate and also rely on word of mouth. So have your aunts, have your cousins, have your mom, have your friends kind of spread the word that we're having an outdoor beachside wedding and casual slash dressy casual clothing is totally appropriate. That way everyone gets the message and your Uncle Steve doesn't show up wearing a tuxedo when everybody else is in khaki shorts and button-up polo shirts. I hope that's helpful. And again, thank you very, very much for that question. Next up, advice on a mixed gender bridal party. My older brother is my person of honor and I want him to both match my bridesmaids and stand apart from the groomsmen without upstaging my fiance. Any ideas? This is a very timely question considering that we just talked about your wedding party, specifically bridesmaids, uh, just a couple of weeks back. So this is kind of a follow-up question to that. Now, it's a great point. It's a wonderful point to highlight the fact that naturally we do not always have the same gendered individuals in our bridal parties. So it is very, very common to have both men and women standing up on both sides. And that creates a little bit of a trick when it comes to the dress code. Well, Okay, so our question before, we're really tying things together for full circle here. You want that individual to, you want it clear that they belong in the wedding party, whether on the bride's side, the groom's side, whatever side they're on. You want it clear that they are a part of the wedding party, but you want to differentiate whose side they're on so that people can know, oh yeah, that's Coraline's brother's best friend and he belongs on her side and you can kind of tell that because he's wearing the same color as her bridesmaids are and he looks a little different than all the groomsmen over on that side but he also of course looks different from the groom. Okay so essentially here what you want to do is you want to tie that person in with your in this example we're using bridesmaids with a man coming over to the bride side. So you want him to compliment your bridesmaids stand apart from the groomsmen on the other side and then of course obviously be differentiated from the groom. With Women's dresses, I feel like this is all much easier because there are so many options for color, for style, for cut, for shape when it comes to a dress. When it comes to guys in a suit, I feel like you're a lot more limited, which makes this a little bit more challenging. I would recommend that this man who's on the bridesmaid's side, let's put him in the same suit as the groomsmen on the other side, but use a different colored accent. So whether that's a thing, waist vest or cummerbund, I guess they're called sometimes, whether that's a tie, whether it's a bow tie and pocket square, whatever everyone else is wearing, let's 
differentiate him from those other groomsmen. And ideally, that color will also tie in with your bridesmaids. So if they're all wearing coral colored dresses, go ahead and give him a coral colored tie or a coral colored pocket square and bow tie. And then as far as differentiating him from the groom and the other groomsmen from the groom for that matter, this can be as simple again as switching up the colored accents. I will say it's most likely going to be very obvious who the groom is. He's going to be the one up there kissing you. So (laughs) there shouldn't be a ton of confusion about that. But Again, a really easy way to just distinguish him from the other men in the bridal party would be, again, to play with those accents. If you wanted to take this a step further, you could also put the groom in an entirely different colored suit from the groomsmen. So an easy, really clean, really good example of this that comes to mind right away. Let's say all of the groomsmen are wearing like a charcoal colored suit, a darker gray colored suit. Put the groom in a really light shade of gray or a silvery shade of gray so that his suit is entirely different from all of the other ones. That look is really going to pop in your photos and it's really going to create a nice distinction between you and your groom versus all the rest of your bridal party. Certainly wouldn't have to be gray that you're using. You could do this with blues. You could do like more of a navy blue for the groomsmen and then a lighter powder blue or dusty blue shade for the groom. Endless possibilities. Use your imagination. And don't forget my listeners can get a custom suit from Indochino with promo code WEDDING. That's a custom made to measure suit for just $359. This is an amazing deal. And it's a perfect situation where you can get the groom a really, really nice custom suit. The turnaround is quick. The shipping is free. And that's a great deal. They also have tons of customization options. Again, that website, Indochino.com, and you'll use promo code WEDDING. And next question, how should we word our invitations when the ceremony is in a different place as the reception? Great question and very common situation. I'm always a fan of having both on the same location, if at all all possible, but of course this is not always possible. So communicating to your guests where the ceremony is taking place and where and when the reception is taking place so that they can have a heads up on where they need to go from A to B as the day, as the wedding day progresses. So option number one is within your wedding invitations, you can provide a directional card. So this would be a separate enclosure in your invitation that has directions. Sometimes you'll see like a screenshot of a map with a highlighted route to take. It'll contain the address of both the ceremony and the reception, the name. That way your guests can just slip this piece into their pocket or into their wallet, pocketbook, whatever, and have that information right at their fingertips on the wedding day so that they can get from the ceremony to the reception really easily. An even more streamlined and more affordable option, those directional cards are going to cost extra money on your invitation. So if you're trying to keep things really, really minimal, really, really low cost, an even easier suggestion would be to write out the name and address of each location and include that on the very bottom of your invitation. So you have the ceremony taking place at ABC Chapel and 123 Main Street, and then you have the reception taking place down the road at reception hall and the address. This lets your guests know at a glance that we're dealing with two separate locations, that they will need to have a car with them, that they will need to get from A to B. Then you'll include the detailed information on transportation options, the times, the full address, a link to a map, etc., etc. You can include all all of that supplementary information on your wedding website. And then best practice, regardless of what we're talking about on the invitation, I would always suggest, I think it's very helpful to include a link to your wedding website on the invitation as well. 
that gives people a really, really easy at a glance way to know exactly where to go to get more information, whatever it is that they're looking for. And I'm actually going to segue here. I'm going to kind of do a little side trip off this question about your wedding invitations. I bridged into wedding websites and I just want to go over really, really quickly. When you're designing your wedding website, I would recommend that you put yourself in any of your guests shoes and think of all the questions that they're going to have. Good ones are, what's the dress code? We talked about that at the top of the show. Are the reception and the ceremony in the same place? Are we driving our own car or is there shuttle transportation? Is there going to be a full meal served or is it only appetizers? Where are they registered? What are the gift preferences? Where can I get that information? How can I RSVP? Maybe I lost my RSVP card that originally came with the invitation. Is there an option to RSVP online? Is there somewhere I can post questions for other wedding guests? I know this sounds over the top, but if you're proactive and again, you really put yourself in the shoes of the guest and just brainstorm any possible question that anybody could ever have and then tuck all of that information somewhere on your wedding website so that people can go there and get it, it's going to save you a lot of headaches down the road. It'll save a lot of back and forth between people who do have questions. And we want everything, of course, to just be as streamlined as possible. So that's a tip, a bonus tip on creating your wedding website. In addition to that tip on including the information on the ceremony and the reception locations on your wedding invitations. And speaking of your wedding invitations, today's show is brought to you by our friends at Newspaper Club. Newspaper Club has been helping people print their own newspapers since 2009, and they give you a really fun alternative to traditional wedding stationery and invitations. One of the top questions I get from you is asking for really creative ideas and ways to personalize your wedding. And Newspaper Club is hands down one of my very favorite personal touches. Designing your own newspaper and sending it out as a save the date, a wedding invitation, or even using it as a wedding day program is a really creative way to express your personalities and add a really personalized touch to your wedding day. Newspaper Club has printed more than 12 million newspapers for thousands of customers all over the world. And with flexible print runs starting at just one copy, it's perfect for any size wedding. You get to choose from lots of free templates, and there's absolutely zero design experience required to create an unforgettable wedding keepsake for you and your guests. You can enjoy easy online ordering and order free samples at newspaperclub.com and get 20% off your order up to a $100 discount with promo code WEDDING. Julie and Brian from New York City share guests absolutely loved the newspaper invitation and brought it with them to the wedding because of all the destination guidance. Many actually kept them long after the wedding as a keepsake, which was particularly touching. Get started creating your very own personalized wedding newspaper. That website again is newspaperclub.com to order free samples and get 20% off your order up to a $100 discount with promo code WEDDING. Another really common question I get asked from you is whether or not you should use a travel agent for your honeymoon plans. And my answer is a resounding yes. I think couples can be afraid that hiring a travel agent is going to be one more expense they have to pay, and that's simply not true. In fact, our show sponsor today will plan your honeymoon for free. Yes, free. If you're looking for a unique and unforgettable honeymoon and wanting some free help with the planning, booking, and details, let the team at Susan's Travel Services do the job. With over 24 years experience traveling the world, Susan and her team specialize in tropical destinations, cruises, Europe, South Pacific, Africa, and more. From an overwater bungalow in the tropics to the animals of Africa to the northern lights or a beautiful beach in Mexico, they've seen and done it all and want to share that knowledge and experience to help make your honeymoon an unforgettable trip. 
Susan and her team would love to get to know you, find out exactly what type of honeymoon you're looking for, and make your dream trip happen. Don't get overwhelmed with the millions of places and options online. Get some free help and rely on professional experience to make sure you get exactly the honeymoon that you've been dreaming of. To get started, simply email susan at susanstravelservices.com and mention that you heard this ad for $50 off your booking. Don't miss this opportunity for free honeymoon planning services. Email susan at susanstravelservices.com. Back to the show. Okay, we're back with more of your wonderful questions. First up for the second half of today's show, do you have any thoughts on providing transportation in a rural area to and from the hotel and the venue? Great question. Transportation can be a tricky little devil, especially when you're dealing with a venue that's out in a rural area and things like ride sharing and public transportation, taxis, etc. are not readily available. So to get started, I would recommend doing some research and calling around to some transportation companies in the area just to get quotes for what it would cost to shuttle guests to and from the hotel where the majority of people, it sounds like, are going to be staying, and the wedding venue. It's really, really thoughtful if you can afford to add transportation into your wedding budget. This is an extremely thoughtful touch that I guarantee your wedding guests will really, really appreciate. So step one, call around, make some phone calls, do some research online, and get a general idea of what it would cost to have shuttles available for that two or three hour window when people would be going back and forth. Now, if full-blown hosted transportation like shuttle buses is not within your budget, then let's talk about some other options. Are there ride sharing services available around your venue? So this would be a Lyft or an Uber or good old-fashioned taxi cabs. It seems like forever ago that taxis were popular. The ride sharing services have become so prevalent in most places, but not all. So let's research and see if there are drivers available in the vicinity of your venue. If you live close by, I would suggest going out to the area of your venue in the evening time. Don't go alone. Grab a buddy, grab your fiance, go out there and just pull up the ride sharing app and see if there are any drivers around. If you see a handful of people crawling around on a Saturday night, then that's a good indication that your guests would be able to dial up a car to get them from the venue back to a hotel. Next step, if there are not ride sharing services available, if we're talking like really way, way, way out removed from any suburban area, there's nothing out there in terms of a Lyft or an Uber car. The next step would be to ask your venue what other couples have done. So how have other couples handled this? What service have they used? Maybe the venue has an actual mode of transportation that they can wrap into your package. That would be a great option. And then, of course, also a great option is to ask the same question of the hotel where most of your guests are staying. Many hotel properties will have a dedicated shuttle bus to take guests from A to B. So ask at the hotel if they have any any recommendations for you or if maybe they even have a service that you can utilize. And then extra little bonus, just to reiterate a little bonus tip, your venue is a great, great referral source. If you're stuck on the logistics of pretty much anything related to your wedding, the chances are that the folks at your venue have done and seen it all. So if you run into a situation that you're kind of stuck on and you're wondering if it's going to fly or you're wondering if there are any other options that you're not thinking about, I would really suggest leaning on your venue and utilizing them as a resource because they're going to have a lot of really, really valuable information that they can share with you just based on what past couples have done. And your next wonderful wedding planning question, what is the proper etiquette for thanking people for gifts that are received before the wedding? 
Now, if your wedding is coming up, if you're getting close in the last couple of months or so, you'll notice that people will start sending gifts as soon as they get the registry information in their hands. So not everybody is going to wait to carry a physical gift or even a card to the wedding itself. A lot of folks will shop early and have those gifts shipped directly to you. So you're going to see them start trickling in well before the wedding day. A lot of the wedding advice that I share is not universal because everybody has unique situations. This question I love because I do have some universal advice for you. Pretty much anybody listening to this show right now, if you are planning a wedding, I have some universal advice on thank yous for your wedding gifts. Start a master list very early on. So in the months before your wedding, don't wait for the wedding because gifts are going to start coming. Start a master list very early on. I am a spreadsheet girl. I love Excel. You can do this manually with a pen and a piece of paper. You can do it on an app. You can do it on your computer on Excel. Wherever you do it, get a list going with the name, the address, the gift that you received, and then add a column at the end to write down the date that you sent out the thank you. Especially if you're inviting a big list of guests, these thank yous can run away from you really, really, really quickly, especially because in those last weeks leading up to the wedding, you have a billion other things going on. So if gifts start showing up at the door and you don't have an organized system for staying on top of this, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So start that list early on. Now, it is up to you. If you want to get a jump on your thank yous and start sending them out before the wedding and as those gifts are received, that's perfectly fine. You don't need to wait until after the wedding to send out a thank you for a gift that arrived a month before the wedding, if that makes sense. You can send out a thank you as soon as you receive the gift, in my opinion. You are also welcome to wait until after the wedding to send out all of your thank you notes all at once if that's what you prefer. Side note that might turn into a rant because I feel really, 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 really passionate about this. I am not a fan of the whole six month rule on sending out your thank you notes and I think some people say a year is okay. I Uh, don't feel that way. Sorry. (laughs) I just, I don't. I do not like the six month rule on sending out your thank yous. I think they should be sent ASAP and ideally within a month or two max from your wedding. If you can't sit down and make the time after your wedding, I don't know how you're going to make it six months down the road. So just make that a priority to express your gratitude in writing. Hold please because I have another side note rant coming part two to this rant is I do not think it's appropriate to send a thank you via email or text or Facebook or whatever technology you can imagine out there to use to send a thank you. I am an old-fashioned believer in taking a pen and writing out a thank you card, signing your name to it, putting an old-fashioned stamp on it, and sending it out. I don't often say that I'm absolutely against anything, but that is one thing I'm just old fashioned at heart about. And I like a good old fashioned handwritten thank you note, not only for weddings, but for any situation in life. So that's my little Kara-ism life tip 101 for the day. Take it or leave it, but those are my feelings on the topic. And next up, this is a really, really interesting topic. We have a question, how much food should I cook per person? We're doing self-catering or family catering. We're doing our own food for the wedding. How much should we cook per person? Great question. I have a really detailed bonus episode on self-catering or DIY style catering, and that is located in the Wedding Planning Podcast vault. But my most basic, in a nutshell, advice for self-catering is number one, keep it really simple. The fewer menu items, the better. Trust me on that. 
keep it simple. Number two, you're going to need to do lots of trial runs and lots of experimenting to catch any tricks and adjustments for cooking and or prepping large portions. Most of us are not caterers by trade and there are a lot of ins and outs and nuances that will come up. So do not wait until the few days before your wedding to start doing this. You need to start doing this months ahead of time to work out all the kinks and make sure that you're prepared for any challenges that might come up. I'm very, very, very passionate about the topic of self-catering and food in general because I love great food. Who doesn't? But I self-catered slash DIY catered my own wedding and I have a ton of information to share on the topic. It is not for the faint of heart. It is definitely not for everyone, but it's a great way to cut costs on your wedding overall. So if you'd like more information, you can get much more inside the vault in a premium episode on catering. You can take advantage of 12 premium episodes that lay out a detailed wedding planning roadmap of every single thing from engagement to wedding day, and also an organized catalog of all past wedding planning podcast episodes with zero ads. That's all available to you, unlimited access, no subscription fees ongoing. It's just a one-time $19 and you're in weddingplanningpodcast.co slash vault. And members of the vault also get early access to new shows. You'll get regular check-ins and opportunities to share your wedding questions. And did I mention zero ads? This is a priceless planning resource if I must say so myself. I'm a little biased, but I would love for you to check it out and see if the vault is a good fit for you. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Again, if you have any wedding questions on your mind, you're welcome to find me on Instagram. Send me a DM. You can also visit the website and send an email that way, weddingplanningpodcast.co slash contact. Thank you as always for being here with me today and spending this time with me. Thank you for trusting me to be a part of your wedding. It means the world to me. I'll talk to you again next week, same time, same place.